And I'm toying with the idea, though, that on the protein restriction day, um, it would be a good day um, to uh, do do resistance training. For one, just to send that sort of epigenetic signal to the body saying, I use my muscle, so go elsewhere. And also um, to possibly uh, uh, kick that protein deprivation up a notch just so the autophagy uh, maybe helps induce it. I don't know. It's all speculative. So right. I doubt that I'm, I'm adding much muscle on that day, but I think it's, it's possibly a preservation and, uh, and an autophagy inducer. So, yeah, there, there is definitely research to show that if you resistance train and don't take in any protein, you're not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, but the carbohydrates can stop most of the catabolic processes mm-hmm, that mm-hmm, happen. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you think that actually, uh, increases the, the protein need in the body? How is that? What's going on there? Uh, so this is, to me, this is somewhat of a of a closed question yeah. because they've got a lot of research of maximum protein synthesis rates. And if you train any type of training, even aerobic exercise, those synthesis or those rates go up. Okay. So you can sustain higher rates of protein synthesis. The open question is how best to do that. Mm-hmm. Is it a constant flow of amino acids or is it one or two large boluses right. uh, during the day. And, I, and again, I think a lot of the stuff doesn't matter until you're getting into sort of competitive performance or, or, or right. high performance kind of muscle gain. So part of why I'm sloppy with it is because I, 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 you know, I'm pretty much only wanting this much muscle right now and I can't screw it up so long as I'm on this protocol. Right. So, right. It makes it nice when you figure out how difficult it is to screw up where you are yeah which i just wish more people would believe that it's that easy yeah you can get there yeah because even even at my mass it's it's i have to do something stupid like go on the warrior diet essentially unscripted to start to lose muscle mass Mm. now you know if i stay within my normal parameters my body fat doesn't go up my muscle mass doesn't go down my my strength might fluctuate wildly yeah but otherwise, it's pretty easy to stay here. Yeah, and I think another, <clears throat> like I've I've put uh, a dozen friends onto the paleo diet, and um, not not many of them have begun the protein restriction and, and autophagy kind of thing yet. But um, they all end up getting like ripped and in the best shape of their life, <laughs> and and I mean the ripped here is is because let's say their 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 muscle mass is going up you know, 15 or 20% or something, but their body fat percentage is just dropping, which for a lot of people, that's, I mean, that's just the the best gain right there. Let's show what you've already got. And, um, and so I've just, I've seen that with folks and, and the way that their body responds to just a little bit of exercise, the cleaner the diet gets is what's super powerful, I think. And that's back to food quality and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, Completely agree with that. Uh, the the only times I I actually got a lot of flack because I wrote an article for uh, Powerlifting magazine, and I had just worked with somebody who was trying to go from. I actually took their body weight from two eighty to two twenty, and they were stronger at two twenty than they had been at two eighty, mm. and then they wanted to get up over three hundred eight because they wanted five elite totals and five different weight classes, and the their body was just at this point that got them back up to 280 they were far more solid held a lot less fat mass but it was very difficult eating good clean food to get over that 280 yeah, mark again right. it was really difficult right and you know i'm somebody that i will deviate from standard advice all the time mm-hmm. like if i know there's a goal to be reached i'll tell you how to get how to reach that goal and so in the article i talked about that which was go to mcdonald's you know eat crap that decreases the efficiency of your body so much mm. that you just start putting on body fat. It, right. it, it's almost amazing. Right. Uh, you're not going to put on a lot of a lot of muscle mass during that process that might allow you to put on more muscle mass later, but it will get your body weight up mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And again, it's that shitty food quality that <laughs> it, it's powerfully anabolic in the wrong way. That's what they do to the cow. I mean, they yeah. they they Stuff feed it, it a bunch of crap so that it's gonna it's gonna essentially age more quickly yeah and they used to stuff them full of pesticides because they found that it caused massive fat gain in a short amount right. of time it's amazing I, I can't remember the statistics for sure i think it used to take two and a half years to bring a cow to slaughter weight and now it takes four months yep. 
That's just amazing. Meanwhile, uh, whatever state you live in, I guarantee that there are too many deer running through the woods because they've lost the natural <laughs> human predator of the human being. Ah. So. Do you do a lot of hunting? Uh, I, I don't do a lot, but I do... Uh, um, I'll do a lot if I don't get an animal, but it's for me, it's all about, it's all about filling the freezer. Right. So, uh, when I, when I went pure paleo and decided that, you know, I've, I've made a little bit of money, what am I going to do with it? Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to buy food quality and say the hell with the price. And, mm. um, but even so I'd walk out of whole foods with a, with a, you know, one Brown bag, half full of pastured meats and $50, you know, gone. And I'm just right. like, this is going to get expensive. And so, um, a friend, uh, who was a hunter realized that. And before long I had 80 pounds of, uh, venison in the freezer from an 80 cent cartridge that I put through its heart. So wow. the, the price to performance ratio there is, is pretty huge. <laughs> How long did it take to, to get that deer? Uh, it was probably, uh, uh, three weeks and, uh, just four, four individual hunting trips before I, before I got one. How long did it last? Um, it, it's, it's still lasting. Um, and I, oh. I, I, uh, because actually there's a lot of parts that other hunters don't want too. So for example, uh, there's, there's a lot of people out there who hunt not for the nutrition aspect. It's just mm -hmm. like a family kind of thing that they do. Mm -hmm. And they tend to not eat the heart and not eat the liver. And just, I guess they've gotten picky cause they're just hunting all the okay. dang time. And so they're just, you know, it's all tenderloins or whatever. Right. So they give that stuff to me. And, um, Ooh. and so, man, you want, you want some good micronutrients, mm -hmm. deer heart, deer liver, stuff like that. So I get extras of those. A lot of folks don't even bother with the ribs. So I get, I get the ribs wow. and, uh, wow. part of the reason that my supply is still lasted is because I actually need to get a, get a bone saw and cut some of these pieces. Like it won't fit in my <laughs> crock pot anymore. There's actually, there is, there is no hiding the fact that this was an animal's leg in my freezer <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and my cooking implements can't handle it right now. So how does that work on dates? Has anybody, oh, it's a fantastic or? filter. Cause yeah. if that bothers you, then I don't want to hang out with you much longer. <laughs> so let's fail fast. <laughs> Are we, oh. should we, yeah. Do you want to take a few questions that we had posted in the forums for this episode? Sure. Um, and you guys are both welcome to, to weigh in on these. Um, some of them are directed at Josh and some of them aren't. Um, let's start with Josh. Okay. So let's see. We already talked about that one. Okay. Here's one. Josh, since chaperone mediated autophagy can't, can't ha handle larger issues. Like very large junk proteins, damaged organelles, bacteria, and virus stowaways. Do you have any suggestions that can get rid of these via diet? Yep, that's the whole uh, idea behind triggering macro and, and micro autophagy. That they can they can handle what carrier mediated autophagy can't. And so, <clears throat> I'm not sure if if um, you know this is such a such a new field, the the studying the autophagy. But it it may be that that those have been going on in, in reasonable rates and things like this, but that this, the observations have just been on the carrier mediated autophagy first. So, um, but according to, to books like protein cycling by, by Ron McNary, we can, we can absolutely, uh, in enhance and induce those second and third kinds of autophagy, uh, much more often. So that's probably why they're there. Yeah. And, and just to be clear, the, chaperone slash carrier mediated autophagy can pick up some viruses and bacteria. Mm, um, yeah. If they're, if they get marked, right. If Correct. the body figures out. What Correct. They are. It, that's exactly right. Some of them have cloaking devices and Correct. your body can't find them. And that's where this non-selective process is good. Wow. There's so much to this. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. And so just to put a finer point on that, uh, McNary has these calculations and, uh, I don't remember what they are offhand, but let's say if you do two 24 hour periods of autophagy and again, I do, I do, per I do week per something? week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He has a whole table, but oh. I, and so I do the 32 hour because just in the evening, um, I'm thinking, well, geez, if I just keep eating fat and carbs instead of protein, then I get to go to bed and like keep this train rolling, you know? So let's, mm -hmm. let's use that. Let's not bring it to a halt. Um, but you know, even for two 24 hour periods, I think it's something like, you know, half your cytoplasm will have been, uh, filtered through in some number of years that mm -hmm. he calculates. But the goal there is that at some point you would like for all your cytoplasm to have been filtered through, even if it takes 10 years, mm -hmm. that that would have been a super therapeutic event to have happened. So I, I'm still curious, where did he get all these calculations and just, I'm going to, I'm going to say here that that this is where I, I kept more of a 30,000 foot view and, and kind of 
bowed to the authority of all these charts and graphs and calculations and equations. Um, I know good science would be to go through and and uh, and vet some of those, but mm. um, that's why that's why I do like the thirty-two hour instead of the twenty-four and stuff like that. And, and the eighteen that's very speculative. We don't know how much autophagy happens on an eighteen-hour restriction. Right. So um, I, I did. I remember reading something last night that the process is very rapid. It starts rapidly, though. Mm. Um, the autophagic responses to changes in the diet, especially in exercise, are, <clears throat> are very rapid. Hmm. Um, and unfortunately, that was one study that I read through, and it's very cursory. But yeah. I, I read one that said mm-hmm. within several hours, uh, mm-hmm. cells and culture will, you know, with protein deprivation, uh, amino acid deprivation they will so they were saying around two hours or so but i think you know what matters is in vivo and it's just harder to observe that right now right so all right <clears throat> let's field this question about sugar alcohols uh is even one gram going to set you back like eating one gram of erythritol or maltitol or sorbitol it really depends on what you're eating that sugar alcohol with if you're eating it by itself well, one gram, it's questionable. It, it is possible to knock you out of ketogenesis. So ketogenesis is actually a very delicate process. Uh, so that is a possibility. And sugar alcohols have been known for decades for their anti-ketogenic property. I mean, that's that's one of the things they knew about sugar alcohols before they really even understood the full metabolic pathways of all of them. And that's because it's processed in the liver. So the liver Correct. has to okay, switch gears for a little bit. Right. And apparently they're highly selective for the enzymes and pathways that also trigger ketogenesis. So, the- so yes, I would just – there's I, – I don't really see any reason in the world why you have to include sugar alcohols in your diet. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean erythritol might be safe. It's just because they're they're found in more and more products these days. Right. Well, eat less and less of those products. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I, do, they, do they trigger the <laughs> – are you in the camp that says that the sugar alcohols um, up the insulin – um, it, it depends. Some do. Yeah. Some some have been shown to produce an insulin response, and yeah. some haven't. Like sorbitol, maltitol, I believe, uh, both trigger insulin significant insulin responses. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe erythritol is one of the safer ones okay. that basically does nothing. Uh, I'm I'm not sure 100 percent of its effect on ketogenesis. If there was one that I had to go with to be safe, it would be erythritol. Um, otherwise, I would go for things sweetened with sucralose. I mean, that stuff has no metabolic pathways in the body, well, save some very reserved pathways that are only going to occur in extreme nutrient deprivation. Hmm. So that's probably not something that you want to take if you're doing a 48-hour fast. So but, don't don't drink Diet Coke sweetened with sucralose, or Diet Cola, I should say. So right, if you're an intermittent faster. Better, okay. So I guess this question has to do with... As, uh, I can never pronounce this. Acesulfame K, Ace K. Yeah, I just say Ace K. Yeah. Um, the question is, how much is okay? Is, is any okay when it comes to um, destroying the magic of carb backloading? Uh, again, it depends on what you're taking. If you're taking it with a high fat meal, mm-hmm. it, it's really what you're going to get when it's added in as a sweetener is not going to destroy the magic of carb backloading or carb night. If you're drinking that by itself, it could start to have some metabolic consequences. Mm. And again, this also, like we were talking earlier, it depends on your level of performance. Uh, people preparing for competition who are trying to get down in single digits of body fat, it will really make a difference. So basically the the best time if you're going to take something with ACE-K in it would be uh, during a high fat meal. Correct. Okay. Let's... Thanks for distilling that down to simplicity. <laughs> Uh, let's see. How about, is there an optimal time to do high intensity interval training sessions? Uh, first thing in the morning before you've eaten anything, 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 or what about the coconut oil kind of thing? I would have to speculate. So I would say don't eat anything. Okay. So coconut, totally fast. Correct. Okay. And do you see any advantage to just doing Tabata training or would you fully recommend like the high intensity interval training, like of a much longer duration. Uh, I, I actually, I use a combination with athletes. So I, I tend never to side with just one or the other. If, if of course it's useful, 
uh, and the and Tabata and Hit obviously are both two modalities that I like to use with athletes. So a combination thereof. What's ideal? Uh, ideally, I would never do any type of cardio work at all. <laughs> Right. But you want to use interval training to deplete some glycogen in certain times. Correct. 